So welcome everyone. I'm Kelly from Social Justice Partners. We are not a housing org. So folks are always like, I'm going to go join this racial equity and homelessness thing, but who are these people? Um, we, it is by design that we are not a housing organization. We are a neutral party that invests deeply in individuals and people who are advancing racial and social justice. We run a racial equity and homelessness initiative, which I'll share more about in a bit. We also have a systems change accelerator, which is for early stage initiatives addressing systems change. That process happens to include a fast pitch event where folks can share about their organizations to funders. So you may have heard of SJP for that. We run a lot of healing justice programs. We have a flagship program called Anti-Racism for White People, which is a learning community for individuals who identify as white and who are working on their anti-racist journey. And then we run some trainings on and really try to live out for ourselves internally what it means to be a liberatory workplace. I am Kelly. I direct this racial equity initiative. My background is in housing and homelessness. So I started as a frontline worker um, at Chrysalis. I did direct services, employment, case management, and outreach. And I also worked inside the LA County jails for a few years doing direct inreach to folks who were trying to prepare to come home and then have done a number of things throughout the system. Um, our executive director, when we started this initiative, I'll say my vision was to come to SJP to be in partnership with Christine Margiata, who's our executive director, who's a white woman. If you were to look at our website, I always tell people that very upfront because we believe in shared leadership. Christine is on the Measure H advisory board. She has a career career in housing and homelessness um, systems change, and together we work closely to impact our spheres of influence. So she does a lot of work with white executive directors across the sector to help them think about what it means to create anti-racist organizations. And so as partners and co-creators, we hold the initiative together to think about how do we both invest in and care for leaders of color while pushing and actively challenging systems that have been harmful and created harmful spaces for us. I have the great privilege of working closely with Frank Romero Crockett, who you met in the beginning. Um, I'll pass the mic back to Frank to introduce himself and then maybe round out a little of the SJP stuff if you'd like. Um, my name is Frank Romero Crockett. My pronouns are he and him. I am the program manager at uh, Social Justice Partners LA, specifically in the Racial Equity Initiative. And uh, my background uh, before coming to SJPLA back in August 2021, I worked for several years at United Way uh, in their kind of uh, communications and policy advocacy around the Everyone In campaign, helped launch that and uh, kind of worked with our field organizers for a number of years. So as I shared in 2019, pre-pandemic, there was this moment in time where a lot of leaders in the sector were talking about what, we're talking about people, we're talking about individuals. What does it mean to retain leaders of color? How can we get more leaders of color in? Why doesn't anyone stay in the sector? I'm sure you all have heard or part of, or maybe a product of these conversations. And I was able to um, pull together this framework that said, well, I suspect there's probably some underlying reasons why, 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 right? Why all of those things don't happen. And so we begin to think about what it would mean to recruit new talent into the sector, diverse talent, people of color, people with lived experience and create pipe, pipelines into the sector, equip leaders in the sector um, with the skills that they need really to lead together collectively and through a lens of collective impact and then to retain those workers by creating a sector that actually centered people. Um, we often talk in the initiative about not just preparing leaders of color to be leaders in the sector, but preparing the sector to receive the leader of the leadership of people of color. And so we try to do this holistic approach. Today, you're here to learn about the Racial Equity Fellowship, but we wanted to be really clear that it's one prong of an approach that we take to really radically transform our system. I tell folks, we don't talk too much about like ending homelessness. We talk a lot about what it means to be individual players in a system that has been designed to harm, exclude, and leave out a lot of us. And so what does it mean for you as an individual leader to navigate that, to lead people and teams through that, and then ultimately probably work for an organization that plays some role in that? 
So we do a lot of things. We send out a monthly newsletter with some leadership level opportunities. We've hosted recruit events in the past to highlight specific positions at agencies. And in the fall, we'll be launching a new policy and systems change fellowship to help um, emerging leaders connect to the work that's happening in the public sector. In our equip screen, we do tons of healing justice work that's led by our colleague, Ali Simon, and we run this racial equity fellowship, which we'll share more about. And then in, on our retention efforts, we have really invested heavily, sort of doubled down on this notion of pay equity and living wages. So we have an ongoing study that will hopefully um, give some, some feedback in the fall about how we do that better as a sector. We run a, a round of frontline worker grants where we give org uh, funding directly to organizations, and then we hold a C-suite affinity group for executive directors who identify as white, who lead organizations, and they're trying to shift and change them. So we can talk about the full work of the initiative all day, but these are just the three streams. So know that you are couched in a good strategic, holistic approach of really transforming the sector and that this is not a fellowship that's about fixing you, changing you, doing anything for people of color. This is truly about transforming the sector so that it can be based on principles of equity and justice. And I think I'll pivot back to Frank to talk about the fellowship on the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. So the Racial Equity Fellowship we really wanted to create, again, what Kelly was sharing, this is not about um, fixing your leadership. This is really about uh, creating a community of BIPOC leaders, specifically in LA County's uh, homeless response sector. Folks who really wanna to aspire towards executive leadership, be at those decision-making tables and really lead the county in ending homelessness. Uh, it's difficult to find time to reflect time to uh, commune with other leaders within the sector. So really, we create that space and time for that introspection and really to ground fellows in the truth of their own innate leadership abilities. I think there's a, a sense of, we don't wanna operate from a sense of scarcity, but of abundance, uh, feeling that we need to have all these things checked off for us to move into executive leadership. We believe that you have those abilities right now. Yes, not everyone is really good at budgets, myself included, uh, but in terms of leading within the sector, we know that uh, we have those capabilities. We also want to create a space where we can learn from each other. So this expansive learning environment, really breaking down what is the problem? What are the issues within our sector? How deep does it go? And how do we develop solutions uh, around that? And also rooted around the wisdom of the people who are impacted by this systemic injustice. And then last, develop these bonds, develop our connection, uh, develop some partnerships between our organizations. Uh, it's pretty easy to kind of work within your organizational silos and not build relationships with folks outside of the organization. So we try to do that within this fellowship space of how do we build those relationships? Also, how do we build a sense of accountability with each other? Uh, a few things in terms of what fellows will receive as a part of the Racial Equity Fellowship. We give a one-time 2,500 unrestricted stipend paid directly to you. We will also give access for each fellow to help you craft and communicate a personal leadership narrative and identity. Uh, you also have an opportunity to receive some executive coaching one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And then in terms of time commitments, uh, half-day sessions every third Thursday of the month, uh, from 12 to 4 p.m. I'm going to pass it to Kelly for eligibility. Thanks, Frank. Just to clarify eligibility, so this is a fellowship for leaders of color. So you must identify as a BIPOC person, Black, Indigenous, or person of color. We are intentionally investing directly in leaders of color. There are tons of other professional development opportunities out there. Frank will highlight some of those at the end. So if, if you don't fit within this eligibility, it's okay. You have to work at an agency within LA County's homeless response sector. We say that it's intentionally vague. We're, this is our second year of the fellowship, but really LA County organization. So you might think of someone that works any of the coordinated entry leads, any of the public sector partners, DMH, Department of Health Services, 
Department of Public Health even. You might work at a shelter, an outreach facility, an interim housing site. Um, so anyone on, on those spectrums, you might work for an advocacy organization that does lots of advocacy, um, but directly related to ending homelessness. Um, it's our hope that you're available for all of the fellowship sessions. So if you already know that you're starting grad school in the fall and you're gonna be in class all day on Thursdays, unfortunately, this is not the right opportunity for you. We know that things come up and obviously if you're accepted, things will change, but third Thursdays from noon to four will be our primary meeting time. So we hope that that works for you. This is a fellowship that's specifically designed for folks who want to step into executive leadership. And we, what we mean by that is sometimes we say C-suite. So this would be your CEOs, your chief program officers, your chief finance officers, or executives, right? So your executive directors, your vice presidents. Um, and we're targeting this group, I'll just say very intentionally, because we know that leading in general is hard, but we also know that in this moment in time, to be an executive leader across Los Angeles County working to end homelessness is scary and lonely and isolating and politically overwhelming, and you won't be able to do it alone. And so we try to build community across a cohort of leaders that are right on the cusp of stepping into executive leadership. So you likely already manage a team of people or a program or a department. You've likely managed initiatives. Maybe something new has started. You've been in and around the sector for five to seven years. So you have some knowledge, you know, of the acronyms and all of that. Even though I'll be honest, like we don't talk too much shop in the sector, it's important that you're around a community of peers. It is important that folks know that that you know sort of the lay of the land and you should have a track record of impact and this is vague so some people are like well what do I need to have done so you might have managed staff you may have launched a new program when measure h started years ago you might have worked really closely with public sector partners to set up a project room key site you may have led trainings and onboarded a number of folks with lived experience right so track record of impact is broad, but it's really important that you be able to articulate the ways that you've worked to affect change in the housing and homelessness sector. So we have invited four of our alum to be here with you. What was one major takeaway that you feel like you received as a gift from this fellowship? And what was something that maybe you learned about yourself that you maybe were able to reflect and or I guess come to as you were able to be in the fellowship? Um, I can go. Um, for me, um, I took, a, well, one thing that I did gain was a mentor. Um, I was able to connect with a great mentor. Um, she and I met um, outside of our normal fellowship meeting times, but we still meet now and we were able to connect one-on-one um, -on -one. Um, one of the takeaways that I took from this fellowship was really, um, really learning to not silence myself, to make other people feel comfortable. Um, I tend to, you know, kind of sit in the background, but, you know, I've become, well, I've always vocal, but I think this fellowship uh, provided me the space and opportunity to really um, voice my concerns or my opinions about what I know is not right or how I'm feeling or, you know, just making other spaces for people to be comfortable, but I'm uncomfortable, you know, I'm, it's not my job to make everyone comfortable, you know, and until, and I said this during our breakout, until we are comfortable having uncomfortable conversations, um, we're constantly going to be in this revolving door of, you know, just trying to need to change spaces and create spaces for people of color. But I think for me, um, this fellowship gave me the opportunity to do that. It was really an opportunity for me to connect with um, some great leaders um, and people really underestimate people who are in certain positions and they don't realize the value some people bring to organizations until they leave. Jeffrey, I saw you unmuting to share too. Do you wanna share? Yeah, I wanted to say, first of all, hello to Andrew. I know Andrew from SPY, but <laughs> I wanted to also say that, that Andrew, um, yeah, there was a great synergy that we were able to develop with like-minded BIPOC leaders. And it, it was awesome. It, the, there's an awesome power in collectivism when people come together in a selfless way uh, and try to achieve a goal. So 
that was my biggest takeaway. It, it was a it was a it was a very deep and spiritual experience mm -hmm. of collectivism and, and people coming together um, and being to being able to speak uh, candidly and boldly. Well, I think it was unacceptable to not bring your true self, whether you were crying, whether you were happy or whatever you were experiencing, you had to bring your true self. So for me, that was, it was a very rare opportunity to be, be myself and be who I am and, and give whatever I can to the process, but it, it was a great experience. Thanks, Jeffrey and Tia. Other questions uh, do folks have either for alumni or for us? Logistics questions, anything, anything else we can tell you? Sure, I have a question. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to figure out if this is a good fit for me, um, just in terms of what the material will be like and also my schedule. But uh, what would it look like if I happen to join and then at the or like towards the beginning, I realize that it's something that maybe is not, you know, it doesn't fit with what I'm trying to do in my career path right now. What would that look like? Maybe before we answer that, uh, Araceli, I would love to hear like, what, what, what are you looking for? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to figure that out. I'm, I'm looking for something that will continue to help me develop my leadership skills. And yeah, I, I guess that's, that's what mostly what I'm looking for. And I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to understand more so what what this offers us in that capacity. Yeah, I mean, so if that's what you're looking for, then I would say that it's definitely a space for you, right? Um, it's not one of those things where I would say it's like a trick quiz or question that's gonna pop up and you're gonna have to do like this homework or this thesis mm -hmm. statement. It is not meant to be in that way. It's really a convening, like Jeffrey said, of like-minded individuals who are looking for support on their journey to executive leadership. Um, so as Tia talked about having a mentor, as I share with my group, being able to be given an executive coach, being able to go through a branding conversation of like, what type of leader do you want to be to the outside world or to social media? Do you want to compartmentalize your way and your being, which you have your personal life and then you have your professional life, or do you want to, you know, put those things together? Um, do you want people who are going to uplift you and let you know that like, hey, like you're making the right choice and that you're moving in the right direction? Um, and so if you're looking for something that's more concrete, like a certification or a ticket that you're going to get at the end, then I would say that it's probably not the right space, right? Because it's not designed for that. It's really designed in a way that I would consider to be a form of therapy in a way. Right, we, we have all specifically BIPOC individuals been in spaces where we have maybe felt less than or did not know our worth or did not know where we stood in our spaces and time. And so this is a group that really comes together and is intentional about that thinking, but also intentional about how your leadership improve the sector and how can we do that collectively as a group. Um, and sometimes that's just in like conversation. That's just in showing up for each other. That's just in sending a message on like, how are you doing today? How's it going today? Um, like, like Tia said, consider a session. We've had sessions where we have just like vented and cried the whole time as a group, right? Now that wasn't on the first session, so I don't <laughs> want to scare you, but it was, it was towards the end because we have really created a family, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if any of these individuals, not only the individuals on this call, but in the group needed me in any type of way, I would be there in a heartbeat. Um, and I probably have only been in like technical space with them like two times, right? So um, I would say that like, if you are not sure, then maybe you should just wait, right? Um, because you would, could or could possibly take a spot of someone who is truly ready um, and is ready in that journey. So I just say, keep thinking about your why um, and moving through it, um, what, the, what feels best for you. Thank you so much for that. I, I think that's more so what I was looking for. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> and I think also just to kind of um, dovetail on what um, Sean said, um, 
I think that in these spaces, we often, you know, get into fellowships and, you know, you go to the trainings because you want that technical thing. You don't realize the therapy that you need, or you don't realize that you need that space to kind of unload some of the things that you're dealing with every day. You know, when you're managing people, you're taking on a lot of what everybody else has. And as a leader, that's your job. You know, you take on what your managers take on. You take on what your indirect reports take on. You know, you're dealing with all of these things emotionally, spiritually, you know, sometimes financially, but you don't necessarily often have the opportunity to unload that. And this was that space. We created a space and a sense of community where we could come and just unload everything. And I would be the first to say in all transparency, I quit probably every session. I was quitting my job like every session, you know, there were many days that, I, you know, I'm every other word was a four letter word, but that space allowed me to just to be my open and just true unapolog myself unapologetically. And I needed that space. I needed the space to kind of let go some of the things that I've been holding on all week because I didn't have any other outlets. And this is what that fellowship created. You know, it was just more than a fellowship. It was more than, you know, having breakout sessions with, you know, other guest speakers. It was just us creating a sense of community and just being really supportive of one another because of who we are and our backgrounds and where we came from and what we have to bring to the table. Thanks for adding that, Tia. I saw Israel's hand. So my question is, um, so in looking at, you know, the eligibility for the fellowship, one thing that stuck out to me is the years of experience. And so my career path has been very non-traditional and that like I do the work that's like 10, le 10 levels ahead of what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I have to fight to get the recognition. And then, you know, now I've, I've finally gotten that recognition. And so I'm wondering since I'm barely going to be starting as an assistant director, you know, I'm only 24 years old and my goal is to be in the C-suite, but I'm wondering, is it better to just wait, you know, like pay my dues as far as like time goes and, you know, open up that space for people who have been overlooked for a lot of time. So that, that's my question. <clears throat> um, I think on the years of experience, I can just speak practically. So we would say years of experience in your whole career, including graduate school or undergrad or even volunteer work. We know a lot of folks who volunteered, did outreach for a long time, may have worked with their faith community to do work that was sort of parallel. And then now they're in official seats in the sector. So you don't need to have been an executive for, or a junior executive for five to seven years, but tangentially sort of connected to um, housing and homelessness for five to seven years. Um, I will also say, we don't, you never know what's gonna happen. So, and I hate going, yeah. I'll just say, I don't think the application process is very burdensome, selfishly, I'll say that um, we designed it and you never know what's gonna happen. So I think that there, there are waves of sort of it, relational impact and interest and things like that, that happen. So I always tell folks, you know, put yourself out there, even if it's just a signaling to yourself mentally, I am ready for something like this. Like I think the universe listens to us and so, I would just always encourage people to stay in motion towards things that they feel, you know, called to. So hopefully the application process itself isn't that burdensome. Um, if you're here today and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is the right fit. You're obviously on our mailing list already. We do have another fellowship opportunity that will come out later in the summer um, for some folks that might be a different fit. We don't know enough about distinguishing them yet, so we won't go down the rabbit hole of trying to talk through the details, but just know, like, I think just keep putting your intentions and effort out there, whether it's this fellowship or a couple others that we can highlight at the end too. And then we'll take one more question. I heard Tia mention something about sense of community. Uh, how do you, or do you, so what happens after the workshops? Do you maintain, um, contact like how do you because for me community is ongoing um it doesn't just stop and so what what does that look like if if there's a yeah well we have a group we have a group text um and we communicate um that way and then you know some alums we have you know different um gatherings so there's been birthday parties you know we've been inviting you know each other to that and i think we really had a, a nice time to kind of get together one of the few times we were able to get together during our um, commencement activities you know we actually spent a few hours together which turned into several hours together 
uh, where we were able to actually break bread, you know, with one another and just really, you know, just to kind of step back and just kind of reflect on our experience and just be in each other's presence, you know. I would say in addition to that, um, the types of bonds that are made, it's it's like having like a best friend that maybe lives on the opposite coast and maybe you talk every few months, if that, but you like pick up the phone and you're like, oh my God, like that's exactly how it is. I feel comfortable reaching out to anyone um, in our fellowship because the the relationships were that deep. And, and I think that's going to look uh, slightly different given uh, the COVID situation. You know, during this this last fellowship, we were deep in COVID, so a lot of our sessions were virtually on Zoom. And so we really want to meet in person. We're just kind of going to we're going to follow the health and uh, safety guidelines and go from there. But um, given how things are right now, uh, we'll probably see a lot more in person um, activities and events. So uh, it's going to probably look a little bit different, but I want to cover this area right here for, for right now, uh, just to kind of let you know what to expect uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so right now we're at the informational meeting. Our application deadline is going to be closing on Tuesday, May 10th at 11 p.m. I guess very technical, 11 p.m. Um, so there's about two and a half weeks before that deadline. So if you haven't applied, please apply. And if you know some of your colleagues who are interested, please just encourage them to apply and we'll, we'll see how it goes from there. Now, in case this is a little bit confusing, the next two dates that are pretty critical are about a month later. Now, if you saw on the application, it, it, it will ask for your preference if you could attend one of two workshops. Now, again, you are not attending both workshops, but you are attending uh, either one of these and you would have to be invited. So as an applicant, if we invite you to the finalist workshop, then you are considered a finalist. And then from that workshop, then we'll do uh, some of our internal deliberation and then send out the notification if as a finalist, you are now a fellow in the next cohort. And those two dates are Thursday, June 9th, 11 to 2 p.m. And the next day, Monday, June 13th, from 9 to 12 p.m. So those are the two dates. If anything, we just ask that you put a hold on your calendar for those two dates. Again, in the application itself, you'll just let us know if you could attend, if it's possible for you to attend both, if you could attend one, or if you could attend none. And, and I will clarify that if you cannot attend either one of these finalist workshops, and we, you know, we can have some internal conversations about this, but if you can't, for some reason, attend any any of the two workshops, then we would ask that you apply for the next uh, year. Now, uh, we won't give too many details about the finalist workshops, but uh, we will have some uh, of our advisory board members uh, attending, some of our alumni will be attending. And so this is just kind of a, a chance for us to kind of workshop together a little bit about what you're looking for. We'll pose some questions, a lot of discussion prompts, um, but this will be all a part of the application process. Uh, uh, no, we'll be together, um, something like this, a little more intimate, and then um, note that there is a gap between June and then the first um, fellowship isn't until September. So you'll have a little bit of summertime to breathe and get your schedule together. Um, so we won't start meetings until September. All right. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. Have a good one.